Let me introduce our speaker a little bit, and I'll give you a little history. So today we are thrilled to welcome uh, Helen Elizabeth Peters with us. She's a former Miss Arkansas. She's married to Andrew. They've been blessed with a wonderful son. And she speaks and writes in order to help others find abounding courage, strength and faith, resounding hope, and the ability to see the love of Christ throughout life's most difficult moments. And she is speaking from experience. Uh, when Elizabeth, uh, Helen Elizabeth was 27 years old, she met the terrible loss of adversity with strong faith. And I'm going to let her tell her story. I'm not going to take anything away. But that's when my wife made her acquaintance uh, after that happened and they were able to correspond and talk a little bit about what went on and about Helen's powerful witness. Cindy, my wife, was inspired by it and so Cindy reached out to her to share a book I wrote, Hope When Your Heart Breaks, and that began uh, conversations and an email friendship, and that led to this invitation to share. So I know you're going to be blessed by her story and by Jesus' story in her life. We'll see if uh, slides work. If they don't, Helen's going to uh, Helen Elizabeth is going to roll with the punches. But I'd like to uh, we're going to pray for her and present her to you. So let's first welcome Helen Elizabeth. Elizabeth Peters. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to get too close. And then we'll move this out of the way. Gracious yeah. Heavenly Father, uh, bless Helen Elizabeth with your peace and joy as she presents to us from the darkest and deepest valleys of her own life to fill in the valleys and make the rough places smooth of our lives. We pray that this time would be a time where your spirit is present and where you simply encourage us to trust you and to trust your faithfulness in our lives. We pray this in Jesus' name and all God's people said, amen. amen. Um, okay, let's see. I might just, should I, can I just go ahead and I can just talk from this so I can take this off, that would be easier. There you go. Sorry guys, it'll be right there. Podium? Yeah, I'm just gonna head to the podium and use that one. I think it might just be easier with everything. Hey Gus, she's gonna pick up the speaker name on the. Well, hello everyone. Thank y'all so much for having me today. I'm so excited to be here. It was kind of a crazy trip getting in, but you know, it all works itself out and I'm happy to be able to share my story with you. Um, basically, I'm just gonna give you kind of a brief overview of my testimony, but also just how I use one, like one specific moment in my life really helped me and taught me to live content regardless of my circumstances. So, um, you know, this lesson about living content, I think that's something that we all search for in all aspects of our life, not just about having things, but you know, I really started realizing at some point in my life how contentment is really attached to our expectations. Right? Like we have these expectations that built into our minds that we don't even recognize are there. Like we look and say, okay, God, these are, this is how I think my life is going to look. This is what I think life should be. And um, if you would please bless that, that would be great. You know, and if I live well, if I do what you asked me to do, then you'll, you'll do that. So I had to recognize that I had started looking at life this way, that I kind of thought, God, you know, this is what, this is what I want. These are the good things that have happened. Thank you for the things in the past, but okay, now I want to move this way. Will you please bless it? And change my perspective from that to realizing that's, you know, God never actually said he would meet any of those expectations, right? He said he would be there with me throughout everything, but he never said that he would meet every expectation that I put in front of him. So, this, this whole transition of my mentality started at the beginning of what I like to call my transformation period. And so I'll talk about that more in a bit, but my transformation period really was just the time that I decided to take ownership of my faith. Meaning that, you know, growing up I was a pretty good kid, I had that same story, pretty good kid, go to college, act crazy, then realize I need to get my life together, that kind of thing. But then I get, when I got there, it wasn't just a, oh, I need to get my life together, I don't need to make bad decisions. It was, no, I actually want to 
to own this faith. I want to be able to articulate what I believe and why I believe it. I want to be able to say this because I have an analytical mind that needs to be able to see it laid out and say, this is why. And when I know my why, I don't know, maybe it's because I'm a millennial, but you know, if I know my why, I can stand firm in that. Right? So I use my transformation for trying to learn what God's word said and apply it to my life. And of course, many verses stuck out to me, but one in particular, um, is one that you know, but one in particular that helped me with living content um, was Philippians 4.12, in which Paul writes, I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether fed, well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. And so I know that we often look at the next verse, you know, because I can do all things um, through Christ who strengthens me. And I, you know, I, I saw that on the walls of my grandmother's house, and I read that. But when I really started studying this, I just kept coming back to that secret of being content. Now, I knew that that was the, the power of Christ flowing through Paul, and because of that, he could be content. But for me, again, analytical mind, I kind of looked at this like, okay, you gave me the answer, but you didn't give me the steps to get there. And I needed to know how do I like activate this power that Christ says I have to be able to be content because right now I'm not feeling so content. I'm not loving how everything looks in my life, so can you help me do this? And so as you'll find out throughout my story, I am a journaler, I am a self-reflector, and I spend as much time as I can working things out, figuring it out before I can articulate it and see this is the wisdom that God's trying to give me. So I did that. I focused. I, I asked him to speak to me and we prayed I prayed with him every single day just wondering about this and finally he started showing me you know Helen the secret to this I guess you know I've shown this to you. I've shown you the secret in three different lessons throughout your past experiences and if you can just understand these things and apply it you'll be able to be content regardless of your circumstances. So, um, before I go into those lessons, I just want to start with kind of that pivotal moment that I told you about that um, Reverend Newman talked about that happened to me that forced me to really come face to face with this choice to live content. And so that was, I don't know, yeah, we don't have the, that's totally okay. So, there is, my, I was married before, um, like he told you I was married to Andrew and have a beautiful baby now, but before I was married to Craig Strickland. And um, Craig was a successful uh, lead singer in a band, so you know, of course, my parents were super excited when I told them that. Um, didn't go over that great. But I remember we, I, we started dating, I knew that we were gonna get together, we both knew we're gonna get engaged fast, we're gonna get married quickly. Um, but right before I met Craig, I actually started I actually just done a Miss Arkansas USA pageant, and even I actually was not a a pageant girl growing up. I don't know if y'all know anything about pageants or y'all even have that on your radar, but some people are like pageant people, right? I was not that. I was just like, hey, this is fun. Let's see what happens. So I did it. I got first runner up, and I was like, that's great. I'm out. Moving on. So I go, and I was thinking, okay, now I'm done. I'm going to get engaged to Craig, but he was just really, I just feel like you need to do it again. You need to do it again. You need to do it again. So I did it, and lo and behold, I actually won that year, and I remember standing there doing what I, I guess a pageant wave. I didn't know what to do, but I'm like waving at everyone, and then all of a sudden, I get a tap on my shoulder and I turn around and it's Craig and the first thing I thought was how did you get on stage like there's security everywhere how did you of all people get on stage and then I thought of course you know I'm at his shows every single weekend this is my moment you know like, give me my moment and I keep trying to smile but kind of brush him away and you know smile and like what are you doing but he goes Helen I'm trying to propose to you I was like Oh my goodness, I just, I don't even remember anything that happened. I just kind of just froze there. And he proposed, and I remember, I didn't hear anything he said, but I just remember him looking up at me, and then his face looking worried. And I was like, oh, yes, 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 you know. But that night, I sat in my room, and I just could not believe all that had just happened. Like, everything that had just transpired, I just didn't like, understand how and why God had blessed me so much. And I, I know that at that time, that was like the end of my, trans what I deem my transformation period. Um, 
Um, but that was the end of it. And I know during that time, I just had such a humble mentality. Still, I still had this, like, like not no expectations, just like, oh, God, whatever you want to give me, thank you. I don't deserve any of this, so thank you. So that was a good point. But then we go forward, we get married. Um, his band gets signed in Nashville. So we were married for a year, and then we were planning for him to move to Nashville, um, I guess, that summer. Around November, I guess November was our, yeah, so November was when we got our first year uh, wedding anniversary, and then it was December. So, of course, we had just tons of stuff we had to do for Christmas, like we all do. And we got home, finally, and one thing you need to know about Craig was he was a hunter. I don't know if we have any hunters in the room, but, man, he loved hunting. So he wanted to go duck hunting because there was a cold front coming in. I don't Do we have any duck hunters here? I don't know if anybody does that here. Okay, no. But if you, the one, okay, so what you need to know about that, then, is that, duck, the, the good duck mallards, they come in on the front end of a cold front. So he was excited. He was going to go do this. I was excited for some alone time, so I said bye. And he went, um, I think he called me that night, maybe at 4 a.m., and, you know, said, I love you. said, I love you. I passed out. And the next morning I wake up, and I just remember having this strong conviction of, oh, God, I, I haven't been spending time with you. Not like I used to. I mean, this is, I guess, about two years after that end of that transformation period. And so I just thought, I, let me spend some dedicated time. We sat there, and I remember just feeling convicted that, man, God, I've been putting my husband before you, and I have lo looked to him for my worth. I have loved him more than I've loved you. Right? I've, I've idolized him in such a way that I did not realize, and I've looked to him for my happiness. And so I just want to ask forgiveness for this, and Lord, I will choose to love you more than anything, even if you take my husband away from me. I will still choose to love you. And the time that I wrote those words, I had no idea that my husband had already passed. That morning, right after we had spoken on the phone, he had gone in on that, um, onto the water, him and his friend, and their boat had capsized because they had come in on winter storm Goliath, and they didn't realize how big this storm actually was. So it capsized their boat, and that sent us on a seven-day search for them in Oklahoma. So I go there, and I just remember, obviously, being just, what is life? I don't know what's going on. Um, and then trying to deal with that grief, even though we were searching and everyone was saying, well, maybe we'll find him. I, I knew, I, just in the back of my head, I knew. But I remember on like the first day we're searching, I'm getting all of these random calls. I'm getting, from, and I give my phone to my friend because I'm not really a phone person. So I give my phone, I'm like, I just, you deal with that, I can't. And she came back to me and she goes, hey, Helen, you're, this is, that was CNN, and that was People Magazine, and then you have, you have a voicemail, and she basically just went through Fox, through every major media forum you can talk about. And I remember looking at her and going, excuse me? Like, I'm not, in, why do they want to talk to me? And she said, Helen, they're kind of framing this story like Miss Arkansas searching for missing country singer. Um, and so they want to talk to you about what's going on and how you're doing and all these things. And I kind of pushed it away at first, but then Craig's dad, who is an amazing believer who just has so much wisdom, came to me and said, hey, Helen, not to you know get, if you knew him, you could hear him saying this, he's kind of quirky. But he was like, not to get too, you know, biblical on you, but maybe this is, you know, you're just for, for just the time as this moment, you know? Like, if you've really thought about it, though, you've been prepared. Like, you've become Miss Arkansas, and you've learned how to truly use your voice, to speak eloquently, to do all these things. What if you could use this to share your faith? And I remember sitting there, kind of, I, I listened to him, and then I sat there for a while and thought about it, and then those words in my journal came back to me. Just, you know, Helen, you said you would love me more than anything else. Even if I took your husband away, it's time that we share that. It's time that you talk about this. I transformed you to serve my purpose, you know, not to just live life however you want to. And so I decided in that moment that I, I was going to do it. I was going to commit to using my platform that God was putting in front of me and the voice that I had to glorify his name. So while I did that, um, I started doing it. I started just, I, I talked to everybody who wanted to talk, and I just tried to bring it back to God and his goodness and how you find hope in that. And 
I got so many messages from people just, you know, how can you smile? You know, I've been mad at God for so long because he took blank away from me, because he did this to me, because blah, blah, blah. Like, how can you even, how can you not be sad? And I remember thinking, it's not that I wasn't sad. I mean, I remember telling my best friend before the funeral that, you know, I just wish this wasn't my life. And she said, Helen, I'm sorry. And I, that's all that could be said, right? But then I also remember finding determination the next day as all these people came to his um, this funeral to think, I'm going to praise him regardless of what he gives me and, whatever, and regardless of what he takes away from me. I'm going to stand firm in this. And so I think that's really what they were wanting to know. How, like, how do you find that? How do you stay content and have that spirit of calmness regardless of what the situation in front of you looks like? Regardless of the news that you get, whatever that you, you face, or maybe whatever's happened in the past, how can you let go of any anger you may be hanging on to and live content? So that is where I came back to that idea of how do I articulate? You know, again, got back in my journal. How do I do this? How do I tell people about it? Because I didn't want to make it fluffy. I didn't want to just say, hey, you know, like God can do all things. Like I, did, I wanted to tell them because I felt the same way whenever I was looking at Paul's words. What is the secret? And that's again when God said, here, here are these lessons you've already learned that you can share with people. And so I'm going to go into that first lesson, but in order to do that, I kind of have to go all the way back to when I was adopted. So when I was, I was adopted at two and a half years old, and it was a pretty crazy story. Uh, my birth mother was, a, was 14, 15 when she had me. She had been in foster care her whole life. Gave birth to me, or she was emancipated at 14, then she gave birth to me at 15, tried to keep me for two years, but was having to work all the time, and then was in a bad relationship, and we were both suffered abuse, and I was in the hospital multiple times for abuse, and on that third time, I believe it was the third time that I was hospitalized, she said, okay, this isn't, this isn't going to be my life, this isn't what we're going to do, I'm going to change something, you know, I, I don't know what, what I need to do, but I know these people down in Phoenix, I guess she had just family um, down in Phoenix who were good Christian people and she was like I'm just going to go down there and I'm going to talk to them about adoption. So she went there, they got her in touch with the Christian Adoption Agency and they kind of let her just, we stayed there for about six months I guess. Well then across the U.S. in Arkansas, John and Beth were struggling to have kids and my um, and Beth said basically, hey John I need I, like, please, can we just adopt because I feel like God's always put that on my heart that I need to do it and I want like this is what I want so they decided to adopt but unfortunately they were 39 and in Arkansas at the time you couldn't adopt over 35 so they were kind of stumped but then the adoption agency there said hey there's a uh, we have a sister agency in Phoenix and they can you can adopt there so they go there they send in their application and on that application my mother put that or Beth said that she was going to that she would take any child with any learning disabilities with any um, issues up to a certain extent you know just because of um, financial reasons because she was an edu educational examiner for Little Rock School District and basically she test kids help them find kind of a learning plan and everything for them so my birth mother sees this on their application and at the time I was two and a half and I could not speak and so they thought that it was a learning issue that it was something developmental or my just they had no idea so they put on there that I had some kind of handicap or some kind of learning disability um, and so when my birth mother saw this she thought this is the family I'm choosing them so they she selected my parents John and Beth to adopt me and as soon as they got me. My mom started working with me, figuring out what was going on, figured out that I actually did not have any learning disabilities per se. I just hadn't been worked with. And possibly there's some emotional stuff there that was causing me not to want to speak. But she worked with me. She got me the help I needed. And I ended up getting to start school on time and, you know, just become very successful in that. I loved drama. I did all those things. So I go to college. 
I graduate with a um, bachelor's in communication, and then at my master's, well, I was getting my master's in communication at my graduation. I remember coming outside afterwards, and my mom's there, and she's just crying. And I mean, it's normal to cry when your children graduate, but my mom was like crying. So I said, Mom, you know, it's okay. I'm going to be around now. And she said, Oh, no, you don't understand. Like, I'm just realizing, Helen, like, do you not see how God's connected all of these pieces? Like, you weren't supposed to speak, and yet here you are graduating with a communication, a master's in communication. Did you not see the goodness of God in that? You know, so that really was the first time, because this was a little bit before that transformation, or I guess, I guess around the, in the middle of it, that I really realized the sovereignty of God and how much he can connect all the broken pieces of our lives to create a beautiful story that only he can do. Um, but the issue with that is that we have to be able to see that picture as beautiful, right? So I started looking at Romans 8.28, of course we know this one, and we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. You know, I looked at this and I realized, okay, God works behind the scenes, like this is saying, God works behind the scenes, you know, to connect everything, to do everything for good and for a purpose. But the real lesson for me here was not just that, was really that when we look at the word good in this, we often put our idea of good on it. Like we think this is what I want and the purpose that I'm visualizing for my life is this. Then this is what God's going to work together to create. And without realizing it, we kind of put that expectation on him to meet it. Well, I learned in this moment when I really connected everything and saw how he did all of this, and even though it maybe wouldn't have looked the way that my parents thought, I learned this lesson. God's good may look different than my good, but that doesn't mean it's any less good. Meaning God's plan often looks different than the one we construct for ourselves because most of the time we don't put bumps in the road. Right. So the fact that he could connect all of this, all these things to happen, that he could make it where a little girl gets adopted and has these opportunities that she wouldn't have had, that my birth mother got her life together, she went back, got her GED, graduated from college, she's now married and has a great life. Um, I've reconnected with her and it's been great talking with her. And then my parents got to start their family. After looking at all these things, I know that none of the people within that, if someone, if God had said, hey, tell me what you want, probably would not have said, hey, let's make this super hard. You know, let's just like, please make me cry a lot and deal with a lot of things. Like, that's what I want to do. No one would say that. But in the end, he did work it out for good, but just in his good, not the way they thought that good would look. But that doesn't mean it's any less good. All right, so that was the first lesson I had to learn. His good may look different than my good, but that doesn't mean it's any less good. So the next lesson I learned was when I was Miss Arkansas USA and I was doing my very last appearance. So I had my crown and sash on, I'm walking in and I remember I was walking into a children's shelter because my obviously my platform was adoption and foster care. So I walked in and I'm meeting the kids and talking, you know, having a good time, but all of a sudden it just hit me. Wait, this this could have been my life, and why are these why are these children not getting the life that I have? And I just was grieved by that. I mean, just to the point that I just told them I had to leave early, and I went to my car, and I just bawled. Just started crying, and I, I don't even know really all the feelings I was with that. You know, I was confused with God. Why, did, why, is, why are their lives this way, and why is my life this way? And... But then I started feeling a different feeling. You know, like there's another thought that started coming to my head as far as like God telling me, Helen, why, why, you know, why do you think that I've given you this life? Why do you think that, you know, like let's pause for a second. We're going we're gonna to push aside these feelings about the grievance for these children, but I need you to think about why did I give you the life that's in front of you? And I kind of started thinking about, you know, how King David um, in 2 Samuel 7, 18, when he said, Who am I, sovereign Lord, and what is my family that you, would, that you have brought me this far? You know, a long time ago, I, when I was talking about my transformation period, I had looked at that verse and said, this is the way I want my heart to look. Because, because, you know, he has a spirit of humility, and you can feel it. You can feel his love. He was getting blessed, but yet he was going to him and saying, who am I? And at some point along the way, I had lost that heart, and I'd become expectant. 
you know, I started saying, okay, instead of God, you know, how, how do you need to use me to fulfill your plan? I was saying, hey, God, this is my plan. We, how are you going to bless it? And I don't know when that shift happened, but that happened somewhere in there, and I realized real quick, I lost my way on that. And so, I, of course, again, I just I prayed for forgiveness on that, and I recommitted and said, God, I want to serve you because who am I that you would bless me in such a way? Like when I look at what you've done, when I've seen the things, the way you've connected, the, the blessings that I don't deserve, when did I become just expectant of blessings and lose sight that you give me these things to serve your purpose? Which is, again, why I go back to that Romans 8.28 to serve his purpose according to like who he calls us according to his purpose again I realized I was looking at that as no you can kind of take that purpose word out and restate plan you know to bless my plan but really that said his purpose and so once again I rededicated there and said hey I'm going to use my voice that you've given me you know through this crazy plan that you've created I'm going to use my voice and I'm going to use my life to bring glory to you and your purpose. However you see fit, I'm going to fulfill your purpose that you have for me. And of course I knew that around that time I had also joined a church, which is going to kind of get me to my next point. But I joined a church and my uh, there's a pastor there named David who is, I'll tell you in a second, but he was like one of those people that he's fun, but he's also going to challenge you and call you out real quick. And so I love that, but it's kind of intimidating sometimes. But he kind of talked to me about this and um, how I could work this out in my own, in my own mind and the fact that, you know, because you know, as a college student, you think, what is my purpose? What am I doing? You know, what am I going in life? How is God going to use me? And he just said, Helen, you know, the basis of it is just to know God and to make his name known. And then as long as you are doing everything you can to grow in the way that he's asking you to, he'll they'll fulfill that. He'll use you however it falls into place. Okay, so I have this mentality. I realize, all right, so the first lesson now that I'm going to articulate to people is being able to trust God's plan and view his good as still good, even when it looks different than mine. The next one is to start serving using my voice and my talents, my blessings, to serve him and do that with a humble heart, to not have expectancies of blessings in my life to be a certain way, but to say whatever it looks like, whatever you take away, whatever you give me, I'm going to still serve you and love you. But that's what leads me to the last um, lesson I had to learn that actually happened right in the heart in the middle of my transformation. And it has to do with that idea of love. So that David guy that I told you about, um, he was that guy that would just randomly come up. I don't know if you all have anyone like this, but he would just randomly come up and be like, hey, and just like shoot off a question, one, two, three, go answer me, right, all the time. So at church that day, we'd be going over Mark 12, 30. Um, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And so it was a nice, pleasant service. Um, we, I leave, and I'm walking out, and I hear David, and I'm like, oh, yes, David. So I turn around, and he goes, I've got a question for you. Of course you do, David. What is it? And he said, do you love God with all your heart? I was like, I'm a Christian, so yes, A plus for me. And he said, no, okay, let, sorry, let me rephrase that. If God took everything away from you, would you still love him? If he didn't bless your life the way you thought he would, would you still love him? If he gave you nothing in return for your love, would you still love him? And because we had the relationship that we did, I knew that I could be honest and I should be honest. So I sat there and looked at him and said, you know, David, I don't know. I don't know that I would. I need to wrestle with that for a little bit. And so I did. So I went and I wrestled. And when I say I wrestled, like I talked with him all the time about this. I mean, I would kind of say, okay, God, I think I'm ready to say I love you no matter. Oh, wait, no, actually that one thing, I just don't want you to do that. Ugh, please don't do it. You know, and I would like try to not think of things. Because if I didn't, maybe I was giving God an idea in my head. So I would just not. Because, like, you know, somebody told me, I think it was my mom told me, like, be careful what you pray for. You know, so I was always worried about it. But I remember there was one day on the way to grad school, I taught classes at the U of A. And so... I was driving to class and I finally just go, fine, fine God, I will love you no matter what. I will love you no matter what you take away or what you want from me, I'll love you. And it, of course, wasn't a very eloquent or pretty prayer, you know, it was kind of more like a spoiled child, but it was still the best prayer I truly believe I ever prayed. 
Because in that prayer, I really was surrendering everything and saying, no, God, I understand what this word love means now. This isn't like I say, oh, I love coffee in the mornings, or I love something, you know, this is, I love you regardless of whatever my life looks like, whatever you ask me to do, I love you. And that is a, I guess, the most profound thing that I've really understood, even though it sounds so simple, it's probably one of the hardest things for us to live out. And I realize that this is going to be a long, a long road of being able to do this, probably obviously a lifelong journey. But I was committed to it. And so I took all of this. God showed me all of these different moments in my life. It connected all these things. And he said, Helen, you know, this, is, this is the secret of allowing Christ's strength to pour through you, to allow you to be content regardless of your circumstances, to release any weight you're carrying because of your unmet expectations. You know, this is it. You have to love me more than anything so that you can release your expectations and embrace my plan whatever that looks like, whatever that purpose is, whatever it is, if you love me more, you'll be able to do it wholeheartedly and find a spirit of peace you've been searching for in everything else. And so I stood on that ground when I lost my husband, Craig. I, I stood on that, and I said, okay, I'm going to be content. I'm going to be content now in my season of widowhood. You know, I'm going to be content sharing what you want me to share, and I am just going to say whatever it is. Of course, I wanted to have a husband, and I wanted to have kids one day, but I finally got to a point that I kind of said, okay, God, whatever, I'm good here. I actually kind of felt safe in it, almost. Like, I'm, I'm growing, I'm doing, and I don't have to think. You're just leading me. But, obviously, God had different plans. And so I'm going to just, as I'm coming to a close, I kind of just want to talk about, I guess, one short story and then just one final thought with this. So, obviously, I'm remarried now. Um, but before that happened, I, I, so, I, okay, let's backtrack a little bit. So I dated a guy in high school named Andrew. Um, so I dated him. He was great. You know, it's so fun, but we're going to college, so bye. And then we got to the end of college, and we dated again. But Andrew got his relationship with God back in order, like pretty, like pretty solid right at the end of college. And so then he said bye to me, because I did not. And so we, I remember that was a whole story. That is actually a funny story. You can ask me about it later. But we broke up, and I kind of thought, well, that was always just a weird, I saw myself with him, but eh, okay, I guess not. So life goes on. We go our separate ways. Well, I guess at some point, um, God called Andrew to singleness. Like he felt really this heaviness of, I feel like God's telling me I need to be single. But then he also felt crazy because he was like, I'm also like 25. Are you, I wanna, are you sure? And of course, you tell your parents that. And they're like, I need grandbabies. What are you talking about? So they were giving him a hard time. But he was like, I just feel convicted that I got to do this. Um, well, then he basically got to a point where he said, I'm, I'm still God. I, I'm, you tell me when to move. So he he got that re a text from me, I guess, two years or so after um, Craig passed because uh, Andrew, or Craig's dad, Randy, and his uh, wife, his wife is actually a widow, so Craig's step, she was a widow, so Craig's stepmother was a widow. And she basically came to me and said, hey, I don't know if you need our blessing, not that you need it, but we know you love Craig, and I just want to extend this as like, if you feel like you need to date, I want you to do this. I want that and so that was very like very kind and freeing but then at the same time like I was just kind of terrifying because I was I don't know about these dating apps and I don't know anything about this and this has all been so changed so much um, but then you know another cool story happened that I'm not going to go into for time's sake but you know eventually God brought me back to Andrew remember that guy so of course I get on Facebook and I'm like looking like is he still single like what's going on and um, make get up the, the courage to send him a message and then turn my phone off for the night because I don't want to know if he responds so you know I just turn it off I don't know I don't know that I'm okay so I go to sleep wake up the next morning worried about this well I guess across our state Andrew wakes up and there's a text and there's my name you know and he's just said okay God I think it's time for me to move um, and it was, it was such a cool story how that all connected and how God made all that work, you know, again, behind the scenes, making it work and connecting it. 
But before I, I don't want to end there because I, I feel like there was another lesson I learned in that, not just to trust him because he does good things um, for us and works things out for our good and makes this beautiful picture come to life. I also want to speak to people who maybe their their story doesn't have that happy ending. You know, not everybody's going to come to this like, oh, everything works together perfectly and has a pretty bow on top, right? Not everything in life can be fixed. But I just, I firmly believe that when Paul says that we can do all things in, through Christ who strengthens us, he's not just talking about the people with happy endings. I really believe he means all of us, right? And so that's where I come back to that foundational truth and the, the secret of being able to do this that Paul is talking about is that Paul loved God, he loved Christ more than anything else, not in just the way that we say the word love. If I was, you know, more educated, I guess, in Hebrew or Greek or, you know, whatever he spoke, like I would know the real word love there. But it was just, he was dependent on him and his love for him was greater than the world that he was in. And when we find that kind of love, then we can release these expectations. We can shed that weight that we've been carrying that we don't even sometimes realize that we're carrying that can cause bitterness within us, the resentment, um, even if we smile and act like it's not. We can release that and we can then reclaim this joyful heart that we've been looking for that gives us a spirit of calmness, of joy, regardless of where we're at in life, regardless of what happens. Not that we can't grieve or be sad because obviously that's part of all of it, but being able to always come back to that point where you say, God, I know that you are good and your good is good, even if it looks different from my good, and I trust you regardless of my situation, and I love you more than this world. So therefore, I will choose to release my expectations and embrace your plan. Thank you so much. Yeah, I, mean, I can do it whenever. All right, let me thank water. you and sure. <laughs> Thank you so much, Helen Elizabeth. What a blessing. And we want to thank you. We have a little oh, thank you so much. basket for you. This probably won't fit in a suitcase, oh, but no. this you can take the items out. Thank and you. So, but we thank you, and uh, we pray you are blessed. What an important message for all of us to hear, and we praise God that he has allowed you to bear witness to him, even having gone through. And, you know, you face life's daily challenges, because how old is your little one? Sorry. 15 months. There you go. So, if you don't know what that is, it's they're young and crying. <laughs> there you go. So, <laughs> continued challenges, right? Uh, Helen Elizabeth has a, a few minutes for questions. She is going to be available from 2.30 to 3.30 as well out at a table somewhere in the vendor area for you to say hi, take a picture. Picture's okay? okay. Ask questions. I should ask first. Ask questions and just to be able to greet her as well. But she's got a few minutes. So if you want to field the questions and we'll give you just a few minutes here, please. Thank you very much. Hi, yeah, so I mean you can think for a second if you have any questions for me. Um, I'm happy to, even if it's not like deep questions, if you just want to know more things, I'd be happy to share. But yeah, how are y'all doing today? Do you have anything that I don't really know if you, there are specific things that I need to be asking questions about asking for, but um, oh yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Sorry. When they found that you couldn't talk, mm -hmm. what process was their therapy or did it come naturally with this new set of parents? That's a good question. So if you can't hear over there, they were, she was asking, you know, with this being able to talk, I got being able to talk and then going to being able to talk, you know, what was the process like? I obviously don't remember everything perfectly, but my mom, Beth, says that said that basically it was it was pretty quick once I found a place of trust. Um, once I started really believing that this was kind of I'm being here for a long time, that I could trust these people, and then that started coming. But then we I did do a lot of um, speech therapy and just continued pretty much through. And actually, just tied to that, um, my mother, like I said, is an educational. Examiner, so she knows just little things like different learning disabilities and things that show that. 
So of course she knew, probably just through my experiences and everything, that I struggled a little bit with ADD and all then she helped me with that. But the main thing was she also realized that I kind of had a mild form of dyslexia. And so she worked with me through that. She actually never told me that though until later in life. And I always kind of struggled a little bit with different reading out loud and doing things. But later in life I was telling her about this and how when I became a teacher that I would get so nervous to read to my students out loud, but I would just sit there and I had this mentality of like you just gotta say confidence and go for it. You know, sometimes you fall and I break my arm like I did when I was little, or sometimes you land. So I would do that and I would mess up, but I would continue to try to talk in front of people. And I was telling my mom this, how hard it was, and she goes, Oh well, you know, that's that's probably because you do have a, a little bit of dyslexia. And I was like, What what? That's like, why didn't you tell me this? And she said, Helen Children and people live by what's spoken over what, by what's spoken over them. I didn't want to tell you this because she was like, honestly, hon, it was very mild, and I helped you in ways where you didn't really realize it. But I didn't want to speak this over you and say, and you start to say, oh, I can't, I can't do that. Oh, I can't do that. She's like, I, I knew you could. You, know, you were strong enough, and so it kind of developed. Like it got by my speaking developed all the way through, and even realizing that later, how my whole life is actually she's been helping me without letting me know she was helping me learn how to speak and how to read and read out loud. Yeah. That's a good question. Any other questions? Anyone else? Oh, there's one of them. Is there a verse or something that you go back to when You know, honestly, I think it is the the Mark verse, twelve thirty. But also, I think it's you know that the verse that that's tied to in Deuteronomy. I go back and I look at that whole section. And at one point, I did actually print off and excuse me for not knowing all the exact what it is. But in Deuteronomy, I printed it out. The one about. Um, you know, like put it out on your doorpost, tell it, teach it to your children. Do like, and because to me, it told me that I, I had to remember that this had to be a daily, every single day. Remember, like to pick this on. This was part of my new self that I was putting on after my transformation. My spirit of humility, my spirit of loving God, more. All of those things had to be this daily process. And so, therefore, I, I made a poster and like put it over beside, kind of over beside my bed, so that when I got up in the mornings, I would see that and say, remember, this is has to be my focus or some, at somewhere because it's so easy to kind of divert later and fall off of that and not then go down a path and not even realize how far you've gone like I did that day at the children's shelter. And so that, I think that's really kind of the ones that I always go back to when I start realizing that I'm losing my way. It's more so this is what we have. I have to commit to. The, the importance, obviously, of this um, to my life it has to be as important as it is in Deuteronomy here when it's saying share it, remember it, post it, put it everywhere, teach your children. It has to be the foundation and the legacy that I leave for the rest of with my child now. Everything has to go back to that. Yes. You mentioned commitments and giving yourself over to God. Does that give you a feeling of trust and comfort or being scared and unknowing? That has to your feeling at all times or you know, how's that feeling when you give yourself over to God that way? That's what, so actually, when I give, I do a speech that's really just on my transformation period, and that's something I talk about. It's one of my favorite things because I feel like that was it was a, a roller coaster. But you know, when when I finally realized that it was time, I mean, God had kind of called me, he was calling me for a while as He does. But when I finally made that decision, I remember, you know, there was a specific instant, and in that moment, I knew God was real, and I had a moment of just sheer panic, almost or fear, like He has seen everything. You know, like, he knows, and I just, without even realizing, started covering myself up with pillows. Like, I was naked. Like, I, I, mean, I think it was like how, like, Eve must have felt like I was trying to cover myself, and then I thought, okay, this is hilarious that I'm covering myself with pillows right now. So I pushed, it, I pushed those away and thought about it, but then, after that, I just got, I couldn't remember a whole lot about everything I'd read in the Bible up to that point, but I remembered that when people in the Old Testament seemed like they were really sad about something that they did, they laid on their stay, like, face down and just well, I didn't talk to God, and so I really didn't know what I was doing, but that's what I did, and I just laid there, and I just cried, and 
uh, you know, I experienced this, just this heaviness, I guess the fear went away, and it became just a true yearning from inside of me, like almost like I couldn't even say it, you know, and I, I guess if they say that you know, the Spirit speaks and intercedes for you, I feel like that's really what was happening, like saying, God, I can't even express this. And so as I went to bed that night, after that, I remember him just saying, Helen, this is about to be a process, like this is going to be, you're going to wake up in the morning and it's day one, you know, I'm going to just completely deconstruct and break you down to your foundation so we're going to have to strip a lot of stuff away but we're going to go down to our foundation so that I can build you up into this new creation that I want you to be and that's going to take a lot I'm going to have to renew a lot of things change your like completely transform and so that's another I guess another verse like she was asking that I stand on is just this idea of desiring transformation of my mind desiring for him to search me like, you know just those I love King David because everything he says I, you can just feel his passion I feel like that's where I was it went from fear to groaning, to just passion and determination and saying, God, search me, find anything, show me and let me be aware of it so you can create a new heart in me and an, an upright spirit, whatever it is, just help me be new. And then it became just in, like inspiration and every day just knowing that I was doing the right thing and feeling just this peace and this joy that, you know, obviously like the Bible says, goes beyond understanding. So it was more of like a process of every emotion. Um, but when I I got to the end of that period I was just so humbled and thankful so yeah starting from scared to being thankful let's thank Helen Elizabeth again thank you.